I'm Rip Esselstyn, and you're listening to the Plan Strong Podcast. Do you believe in magic? Well, you most certainly will after today's episode with author and registered dietitian, Desiree Nielsen. She is back for a second time on the Plan Strong Podcast, and we celebrate the upcoming release of her new book, Plant Magic, coming out April 23rd. We'll get into the razzle-dazzle of many of her recipes right after this message. If you're craving a breakfast that's not only satisfying, but also nourishing, I've got you covered. What if I told you that our no refined sugar, whole grain breakfast cereals are crafted to redefine your morning routine, especially if you're hungry for a healthier start? I have three different varieties, date and raisin, berry almond, and my personal favorite, banana walnut. Each are meant to be a hearty and filling base to whatever fruit you want to put on top. I invented this cereal more than 30 years ago, so I would have a clean burning fuel to power me through grueling workouts as a professional triathlete, and for more than 12 years as a professional firefighter for the city of Austin, Texas. By changing up the fruit, I never ever grew tired of this iconic bowl and it's so dear to my heart, it's named after me. I hope you'll try some Rip's Big Bowl at home today. Just go to planstrong.com and check it out. Desiree Nielsen has become a favorite of ours here at Plan Strong because not only is she one of the most delightful people you'll ever meet, but she's also one of the most knowledgeable. She was on the podcast magically exactly 100 episodes ago, and she was also a Brock star at last year's Plan Stock event. She is back with her latest book, Plant Magic, a celebration of plant-based cooking for everyone, and what a celebration it is. This book busts the myth that a whole food plant-based diet has to be expensive, time-consuming, restrictive, or boring. Quite the opposite, in fact. As she says today, getting more really can be as simple as filling half your plate with veggies, legumes, and whole grains, and sure, that can be in the form of a delicious salad, but you know what? It can also look like lasagna, burgers, nachos, tofu nuggets, and even carrot cake. It's magic, I tell you, magic. That's because it's plant magic. And because Desiree is also an accomplished registered dietitian, we also spend some time talking about how she helps her clients change their own behaviors and all these swirling misconceptions about what's good or bad or healthy or unhealthy. It was a beautiful, eye-opening conversation for sure. So please welcome Desiree Nielsen. Desiree Nielsen, welcome back to the Plan Strong Podcast. Thank you so much, Riff. I always love speaking with you, so I'm really jazzed to be here. Well, I'm Jazz too. And believe it or not, the last time that you were on the podcast was episode 145. Wow. And guess what? This episode is going to drop and you're going to be episode 245. No way. <laughs> We've got 100 episodes between the last time that you were on the uh, on the show. How about that? God, that's incredible. Like plant magic out into the world amidst all the other plant magic you share. Oh, well, so there you have it, plant magic. Uh, so the last time you were on the show, we were talking a lot about Good for Your Gut. Yeah. And what an incredible book that you had written, just kind of about the, the gut and the microbiome. And so many people are having issues with that, as you know, um, what IBS, 
Crohn's. What are some other things that are out there besides mm -hmm. constipation? Yeah, chronic. I mean, chronic constipation is so the big one, isn't it? Unfortunately mm -hmm. for all of us, <laughs> with celiac disease, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot is going on with our guts. Which I mean, you and I know it's it's so much about yes, the stress, the way we sleep, but the food and the utter lack of whole plant foods in the North American diet, and that's why. You know, I will shout it from the rooftops to whoever will listen. It's like, we need to get those things back on our plate. Now, you also wrote a book called Eat More Plants. And did was that your first book? Yeah. So I had one book that came out in 2014. Like that was like my first, yeah. first book. And my nutrition philosophy has changed a little bit since then. So I do sort of think of Eat More Plants as like my first book, my mm. first therapeutic nutrition cookbook. And that one was more specifically about plant-based nutrition, introducing that to people, but also talking about chronic inflammation and having people understand how eating more whole plant foods mm. can really help in this total body way, helping to manage chronic inflammation and just contribute to overall optimal health. Mm -hmm. Well, you have such an incredible mastery uh, of of this particular I think swath of um, of what it means to be to be healthy uh, in this arena and just as a reminder for people that didn't listen to the the first podcast we've gotten a lot of new listeners since then can you just give us a kind of quick background on how you got so passionate about plants and you're an rd now and all that yeah so you know when i was a teenager i went vegetarian and i went and we talked about this on the last podcast yeah. but i went vegetarian to impress a boy just in case people are like oh well i don't know if i am an activist enough to go to plant based i was like no i did it to try and impress a boy but the vegetarianism stuck and then you know over the years that that moment where i changed the way that i eat really sort of cracked me open to the idea that oh you can change the way that you eat and it can have an impact on animals or on the environment or on your health and from there started an exploration of what does it mean to be healthy? Mm. How can food play a role in helping us to feel our best? And so, you know, into the bookstore, reading everything that I could and eventually going to university to become a registered dietitian. And my first job as a registered dietitian was in a health food store which was the greatest gift mm. I could ever get because everyone who walks through the door of a health food store, like they're a seeker. They're, they're there for a reason, whether or not they're curious about the, the nature of our food supply and trying to opt out of sort of industrial agriculture or sort of like, you know, this hyper global food system, whether they are trying to heal something in their body, they've had this diagnosis and now they're like, okay, I want to change the way they eat. I want to go to a health food store. So having those conversations with people in the aisles of the health food store, and people are so much more relaxed when they're grocery yeah. shopping than like if, you know, if they're sitting behind a desk or if they're in a doctor's office. So had these incredible conversations about how people think about food, the role that it plays in their life, what they're curious about, what they're confused about, what they're nervous about. And it really shifted the way that I practice nutrition. And, you know, over the years, the more that I learned about our own food supply, because I was like an ovo-lacto vegetarian back then, I was like, the only way that I can eat according to my values and my beliefs is to go fully plant-based. Mm -hmm. And so like this journey sort of happened together alongside. And then along the way, I did, uh, you know, a one hit wonder of a TV show, a vegetarian vegan TV show that was nationally broadcast here in Canada. And then it got syndicated all over the world. And that was called and, Urban Vegetarian, right? Urban Vegetarian. I think you can still stream it on Amazon Prime in the US. I'm not sure. Um, but then came the cookbooks. And I think that's where I really found my passion, not only because I'm an introvert hermit who loves living in sweatpants in my basement, typing away at my computer, <laughs> but it just allowed me not only to dig in really deep, more than the, you know, 10 seconds someone will give you on Instagram or TikTok, but really dig deep into the why behind nutrition, but then even more so 
to give you the how. Because I think as dietitians, we're taught, we're taught all with so much science. It's a five-year degree just filled with, you know, basic metabolic sciences and the science of nutrition. So we're taught how to deal with that. But then we talk to someone and someone has to still go to the grocery store and someone still has to meal plan and figure out how do they feed their family on a Tuesday night. So the real sort of awakening for me was the importance of creating these recipes to make it easier for people to find their way with plants so that they didn't have to do all of this mental math or figure out how to turn my nutrition recommendations into dinner for their family. And I've found so much passion and it's so rewarding to, to make something in my kitchen and then to see someone else make it in theirs and say that, you know, their kid loved it and their kid never likes broccoli, but they love this recipe or that it's become a staple. Like, I love that so much. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can't wait to dive into plant magic and all that it uh, has in store for us. But I, I want to ask you a couple of questions first. Sure. So when somebody asks you, Desiree, like, how do you eat? Do you have an answer? Like, are you, do you say, yeah, I'm vegan? Or do you say I'm whole food plant-based? Or you say, I am plant magic? What do you say? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I think the first thing, because it's easily recognizable and people understand it immediately, is I do say that I'm a vegan dietitian, so people can get the idea that I don't eat any animal products. But then the other thing, you know, if we go a little bit deeper, I love plants. I want to eat as many plants as humanly possible, but at the same time, I have no rules. I'm not about food rules. And so for me, it's like, if I, if I want to eat something, I eat it. I eat whatever I like. And luckily I love a lot of plants and my, my diet is filled with rolled oats. So wait, so wait, I, I, yeah. I, I want to stop you for a sec. Mm. When you say you'll eat whatever you want. So will you eat a piece of steak if you feel like it? No, not at all. Oh, and so, oh, oh, oh. I, I didn't know what you meant by that. Yeah. And this is maybe... This is maybe a really good thing to dig into because I come from a background where people call vegan diets a food restriction. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And I really want to blast past that notion. So I make a choice to eat vegan for animals, for the planet, for my health. Mm -hmm. That's a choice. That's not a restriction because I can eat any. I mean, technically these days it's 2024. I could eat a steak. I could eat a vegan steak. All sorts of things are available to me in their vegan form. Mm -hmm. So when I say I have no food rules, I don't restrict my intake of any. I'm not allergic to anything. I eat all the things that I want. If I want a little bit of chocolate, if I want a cake, if I want a chip, I eat those things. Mm -hmm. Everything is vegan. Yeah. Good. Well, I want to dive into some of your, your musings because in your book, you have these in between your recipe chapters, you have these nice little kind of like uh, pontifications by Desiree. <laughs> I love that. Oh my gosh. I love that. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, but I love your mind. I love the way you think. I love how kind of just you're a straight shooter and I really appreciate that about you. So we're going to, we're going to definitely get into that. Um, before we do though, I need to check in with you. Like, so you're in Vancouver, right? How are, how has life been in Vancouver lately? You know, Vancouver, Canada is currently blue skies, sun shining, and it feels really good. The, the last four years have been, I guess, three and a half years have been, they've been such a ride, haven't they? And, you know, last year, everything started to come to life again here in Vancouver. I mm -hmm. felt like people were having parties and going to concerts and doing all those things. So I would say that life feels really good here. I'm ready for spring, ready for the rain to give up. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. and I think so you were part of the plant stock lineup I and, was. and I think I spoke to you how our family, we took this incredible Alaskan cruise and we ended up in Vancouver and we biked around, you know, kind of Vancouver and it is the beauty 
that abounds there is really like quite magical. It to, is to an <laughs> yeah, it, it's an embarrassment of riches. And I have been so fortunate to travel and I love to travel. And there are so many places in the world that I love. But when I come home, you know, I look at the mountains mm. and I look at the ocean and there's truly nowhere else I would rather be. We pay an arm and a leg for the privilege of living here, but yeah. there's no better place to be broke than like on a hiking trail or on the beach. <laughs> oh, uh, that's good. Um, are you ready? I, I don't think Vancouver's on the path of the full solar eclipse that's going to happen here in just a, a, a couple of days. Um, but boy, oh boy, you know, I'm in Austin, Texas. Yeah. And literally, we have hordes of people that are flying in, driving in. We've got eight people staying at our house for the next five days. Amazing. Um, yeah, it's a thing. It is a thing. I immediately looked. I'm very, you know, as evidence-based as I am, and there is no pseudoscience getting into my nutrition. But I have to admit, I do like a little bit of astrology. <laughs> I'm very sort of like <laughs> fascinated by this, you know, like eclipses. And as soon as I saw that there was like a total eclipse, immediately I was like, where's the map? And Vancouver yeah. is so far from it. <laughs> that's, that's funny because I, um, I did a kind of a bit of a deep dive into your Instagram posts recently. Mm -hmm. Speaking of which, everybody listening, Go follow Desiree. There it is at Desiree Nielsen RD. Her posts are so, posts are so they're so informative. They're so fun. Uh, it's you got a great channel and you do a great job posting it. But you had you you had a post. You said uh, it was like astrological presents, and then you had this butternut squash faro risotto. Yeah. Uh, I don't even know if you know what I'm talking about, but. I, I was like, oh, you must be into astrology. My wife is really into astrology. Yeah. I am I am so into it. And you know, it's a little bit of a like a you know, a, a shadow self of mine because I am such an evidence-based professional, but right. I found Annie Nicholas and like her her app and her book, You Were Born for This, totally changed the way that I think about astrology. And it's mm. just so life affirming and positive. And I think that it's just another, it's just sort of another psychological or energetic tool. You read, you read your horoscope, you read what's going on and it resonates with you in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And however it resonates with you is sort of like probably what you're trying to tell yourself at this moment, but I absolutely love it. Well, <clears throat> all right, let's, let's dive in. Let's okay. dive into plant magic because I, um, there's a lot I want to talk about in, in this. So what was your, what was your inspiration for doing another book? Because listen, you and I both know doing books is no small task and you almost have to like brace yourself for what's, for what's in store, not only yourself, but your family, your friends, your parents. So why did you decide to take on another book? Yeah. And I did three books in five years, which, you know, don't follow me for like life choices necessarily outside of nutrition. <laughs> but like, you know, my publisher asked whether or not I'd be interested in doing another book right away. And exactly what you said about bracing yourself, like I did, I sort of had that like, um. you know, deep breath, you know, hold the world at arm's length. And I was like, you know, I don't know. Um, and I think one of the reasons for that is that both Eat More Plants and Good for Your Gut were so heavy on the educational component and on the clinical research. Like I would be up until midnight on PubMed just pouring through journal articles. And I didn't know if I was ready to do that right away. So that was one piece of it. But then the other piece was I feel like there's a real conversation happening online where people are getting so confused, but also so fearful mm. of nutrition and wellness messaging. And it was really sort of bubbling up in me a frustration. And, you know, I was like, if I do another book, it's going to be a little different mm. because what I want to help, I've given people, you know, a huge piece of my clinical knowledge. I've given, I've put that out there. So someone who wants to come and, and is looking for healing, like I've put that into the universe. 
What I haven't put out into the universe yet in a bigger way is my very deep rooted belief that food is meant to be joyful. Mm-hmm. And what I see is we have sort of like these two camps online. We have the very indulgent, you know, like here's the like triple quadruple, you know, vegan fried chicken burgers with like, you know, the everything fries. And then we have a lot of, you know, here's your green juice and your steamed broccoli. (laughs) So it's like these two things seem to be different. And I don't believe that that should be the case. Mm -hmm. I believe that a salad should be as craveable as French fries. I believe that you should take as much joy in eating whole plant foods as you do anything else in your menu. And so I wanted to create Plant Magic as more of a standalone cookbook without that therapeutic nutrition component to show people that taking care of your body and loving what you eat are one and the same. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and you've, you've, you've done it. You absolutely uh, hit the nail on the head. Uh, you stripped the kale perfectly with this one. And I agree. It's it's not nearly as, uh, and I don't mean this in a negative. It's not nearly as heavy as your other books. It's much it's much lighter, friendlier, um, and absolutely optically so incredibly gorgeous, right? <laughs> it's just a, del- a delicious book all around. So what I'd love to do is this. So you've broken this book up into lots of different um, sections on on the recipes. First, before we dive in, how did you come up with these different names for the different sections? Because I love it. And it's so different than, you know, breakfast, lunches, soups, dinners, appetizers, uh, desserts, you know, was that intentional? (laughs) Uh, yes, I'm naturally a little bit of a weirdo. So, <laughs> like, I I love to be pretty nerdy and quirky with my language. And my yeah. editor, bless her heart, I feel like she spends a lot of time like editing my weirdness out of me. <laughs> Don't you hate that though? I, you know, but but yeah. also because I'm like, well, I think it's funny, but like maybe the entire population doesn't get it as they're reading my book. So, Plant Magic, because it was meant to be just such a joyful, fun, light book. Uh, my editor was like, sort of go for it. So particularly because cookbooks, so many cookbooks are by their nature, we all need breakfast, we all need lunches, we all need snacks. So many of them are sort of broken up in the same way. So I was like, how can I have at least a little bit of fun with, with the titles, for example, you know, like morning things or stuff on bread, you know, and then you have to get into these existential conversations about like, is taco a sandwich? Can we come? you know, consider a tortilla bread, but like for all intents and purposes of the book, it was like, this is the stuff on bread, everything from sandwiches to pizza, Mm -hmm. you know, that is that morning things like maybe it's a beverage, maybe it's not just a porridge, but maybe it's a beverage that you can consume in the morning. So yeah, we had a lot of, a lot of fun doing that. Well, I think if, if I count it correctly, you've got about 11 different recipe sections um, everything from morning things at the top, all the way to staples that make anything better at the bottom. And so what I want to do is I want to go into each section. I've picked okay. at least one recipe from each section. And then I'd love for you to just kind of, um, talk about it. Okay. okay yeah. Okay. So the first thing we're going to go, we're going to do morning things, and then I'm going to hold this up. And then if we could, for those listeners that aren't watching on YouTube, let's explain what we got going on here. But walnut apple breakfast buckwheat. And the reason is because I never have buckwheat for breakfast. And I love a great whole grain, like an oat groat or something like that. And so this is, can you explain, Desiree, what, what, we're, what we're looking at? So we have a beautiful little shot of me pouring some plant-based milk into a bowl of cooked buckwheat groats with some apples. And exactly that. I love, I love oatmeal. Like I am such a huge fan of oatmeal, but there are so many incredible grains out there. And we know that we want to continue to, you know, 
uh, focus on diversity of plants. So yes, oats, but what about buckwheat? Mm -hmm. And there are cultures that do make buckwheat porridges. And so I really wanted to explore that in a way that sort of the North American audience is like, oh, this is something we can swap for our oatmeal. It's a pseudo grain, so it's naturally gluten free for people with celiac disease or non-celiac gluten sensitivity, but also it's just like a wonderful, nutty, rich flavor. And it's got a hearty chew. And I'm someone who likes to feel full after they eat. And so these like really <laughs> chewy, dense grains are so good for satiety. And when you say it's a pseudo grain, does that mean that um, all pseudo grains are gluten free or, or, or cause did you, Help me with that. Yeah. So we call them a pseudo grain. So these are things that are not botanically a grain. So oats are a grain. Wheat is a grain. Even sorghum, which is gluten-free, is a cereal grain. Mm. But botanically, many of the other gluten-free options, millet, quinoa, buckwheat are seeds. Uh -huh. They are the seed of a plant. Uh, and But we eat them like grains. So we call them pseudo grains. Gosh, you are so smart. Oh. <laughs> that is <laughs> That is so good. Okay. So morning thing, we, we got 11 sections, so we're going to stop there. But yeah. next, I want you to talk about this Desiree pontification, and that is how to be well without making wellness your full-time job. Yeah. You know, this is something that I am really, I mean, Obviously, I am passionate about nutrition and wellness. I have made it my full-time job. But because of that, I recognize so many people spending so much of their time and energy, and we don't have a lot of time and energy these days, thinking and doing the mental math on what are, you know, the 75 things that the internet tells me I need to do today in order to just be well, or the, you know, the six supplements that I need to spend hundreds of dollars on. And so I really, as part of this thread that runs through this book, mm. I want to sort of deliver a collective exhale that taking care of yourself is far simpler than you might think. You know, we will go to all manners of like, you know, protocols and therapies because we're exhausted and no one's just talking about the fact that, well, we only sleep four and a half hours a night. So maybe if we like put our phone away at 8 p.m., made ourselves a beautiful cup of chamomile tea and devoted all that energy to simply sleeping, we would feel much better. So I want people to recognize that your nutrition does not need to be complicated. It is as simple as making half your plate fruits and vegetables cooking from scratch most often. Of course, we're going to go out once in a while, but cooking from scratch most often. These are the transformational components of wellness. It's not some super fancy supplement. It's fine if you can afford it and it's fun to you, but that's not actually what moves the needle the largest amount in your health. Yeah. I love that you've, I love that you've, you've kind of broken it down. You said, listen, this can be a lot easier than you think. And we tend to overcomplicate things. Are you tell me this? Are you then a fan of like all the the iPhone apps and the Apple Watch and the Oro Ring? You know that people are wearing to track their steps and their sleep patterns. And you know, have they reached their delta and, and you know and alpha and beta zones? You know all that. What do you think? Yeah. So you know. My mind has expanded to hold two things at the same time. And I say that because <laughs> I've been wanting an aura ring for so long. They're so cool. <laughs> but at the same time, I recognize that for myself, I'm naturally a little bit anxious. Mm. Uh, and for many people, tracking things typically contributes more to your anxiety level than your actual wellness. If you're someone for sleep, for example, like maybe simply sleep is this habit that you're working on and something like an aura ring, if it's affordable to you, can be helpful. But again, we're so, we sort of focus on this minutia. I am not a biohacker. And typically when anyone says like, oh, here's your biohacking tools, I'm like, mm-mm, red flag. You know what? The, kale is the hack. You want a <laughs> hack? Kale is the hack. So, so you're not a fan of David Asprey? No, no, not, not, a, not a fan of that genre of wellness influencer. In fact, I'm trying to be like the antidote to that genre of wellness influencer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we, we're not a fan of putting butter in our coffee. 
<laughs> mm, yeah. No, no. Uh, all right. So let's move on. Thank you. So next we're going to go to dressed up veg, right? Dre Talk to me about that section, dressed up veg. W what's it about? Yeah. So it's about a couple of things. One that I think for a lot of people who are outside of this way of eating, who are just in the plant curious stage of things, they probably grew up particularly in North America where they had this meat potato veg style of eating where the veg was like, you know, just like some plain veg on the side, you know, no sauces, no sort of like anything. And so for those folks, this is the first time I have a chapter that sort of considers veg as a side dish. Because for me, plant-based, like I eat so many mixed meals, so many curries, so many stews, like everything's all jumbled up together. Like I don't often put just like a little bit of veg on the side of a plate. So I wanted to offer that for people who are still in their plant curious phase to be like, look at how beautiful these vegetables can be. And maybe that will inspire them to make more of their plate plants. But I also, it's also inspired by how I like to eat when I go out to a restaurant. I love going out with friends and then we order multiple vegetable dishes, like all those fancy things that, you know, chefs do to just make everything taste perfect and look beautiful. And then you get little bits of everything. So for the people who are already plant-based yeah. to make three or four of these quote unquote fancy veg, which are really easy to make, by the way, <laughs> you know, then you can have that beautiful sharing moment with your friends. So I'm going to go to page 78 and that is the whole roasted cauliflower with green olive dressing. I am such a fan of cauliflower. And when I see one that looks like this, I want to eat the whole thing myself and not share it with anyone. Well, maybe my wife, yeah. but I mean, come on, Desiree. And so explain to people what I'm looking at. So you are looking at this like gorgeous purple ceramic plate with an even more gorgeous spice rubbed, like a deep sort of red color rubbed on top of a cauliflower cut in half over all the lovely green olive dressing. So it's a crushed green olive dressing because me and an olive, like we are best friends. <laughs> uh, it looks so incredible. Um, okay. So next Desiree pontification. Okay. I want you to talk about, you say nutrition is dead. Long live nutrition. That it, you kind of, it's a bit of a mind melt. Help me out here. Yeah. You know, what did I say about my brain holding two things at once? <laughs> yes. My brain is always like this. You know, there's always an asterisk or like a backstory. And the, the sort of um, inspiration for that, that mini essay is that sometimes when I see all of these people trying to help themselves, trying to feel better in their body and ending up in a much darker, more stressed out, more anxious place about nutrition, mm -hmm. part of me wants to scrap it all. You know, I want to tell people to stop thinking about nutrition entirely, unfollow everyone, mm -hmm. get back to just you and food mm -hmm. and to start to trust, you know, when we close our eyes, we know what healthy eating looks like. We know it. It's that apple for a snack. It's a little handful of like peanuts or almonds. It's sitting down to a home-cooked meal of like basic whole foods. And yet we let all of this quote unquote nutrition, particularly on the internet, but unfortunately, even from other health professionals, like many people sharing this misinformation, our doctors, our nurses, our dietitians, they are out there. So I understand how confused everyone is. And if we've gotten to the place where we are seriously considering that oats are unhealthy for us, like, you know, it's messed up, super messed up. And so that part of me wants to say, well, just scrap it all. Mm. Forget about nutrition. We ate much better 50 years ago, <clears throat> like as a society, some people ate much poorer, some people ate much better. <clears throat> but as a society, when we were just like eating simple whole foods from the farm, you know, down the street, cooking them ourselves because we didn't have all this hyper processed stuff and all even, you know, on the quote unquote wellness side. But then at the same time, I am still that person who got into this because I know the transformative power of food. Mm -hmm. That if you are feeling unwell in your body, nutrition isn't 100% of it, but you can move mountains 
with mm -hmm. the right nutrition for yourself. So I'm in this place of wanting to share my joy and passion for the power of food. And yet at the same time, wanting to protect everyone in this like soft little fuzzy bubble <laughs> against all of the terrible information they receive. Yeah. Well, it all makes so much sense. I hear about people that are wearing these continuous glucose monitors and they have their their oatmeal in the morning and oh my God, it spiked to 165 and they've never seen it that high and they, they just can't handle oatmeal. And it's like, no, it's okay. Um, and like fruit, oh my God, I can't do fruit. There's just too much sugar in fruit. And it's like, you, yeah, it, it's, it, there's so much noise and confusion that people don't know what to think anymore. Yeah, we are unwell because we don't eat enough fruit, because we don't eat enough whole grains like oats. We're not unwell because we eat those things, because as we have the statistics, like the NHANES, you know, National Survey data, we have those statistics. We know as a society we're not eating enough whole grains, fruits, vegetables. So the ludicrous idea that the lectins and tomatoes are the reason for our unwellness is just utter malarkey. Yeah, yeah. And you're right. Most... Also, since you're in Canada, you're a wonderful Canadian. Um, I'll say that most North Americans, Canadians probably more than Americans, but most Americans, they're not getting fruits and whole grains and vegetables and, uh, you know, um, green leafies, all these things. It's just, <laughs> it's, it's processed and it's animal based yeah. for the most part. Yeah. All right, let's move on. Salads you crave. You talked about this a little earlier. It was hard for me to pick one. It always is. But I had to go, the, the firefighter in me had to go with the grilled kale. Like, really? How do you grill kale? Like, I, you I, know, <laughs> but a grilled it, kale salad with spelt and dried cherries, just like you stole me, you, you had me at, at um, grilled kale. Thank you. You know, and I and I have to give credit to an incredible friend of mine, Carrie Walder, because I've grilled I've grilled romaine before. I've grilled whole, like cabbage before. I had not grilled kale, and I saw one of her salads, and she did a grilled kale. I was like, "That's genius! I'm gonna try that." And then I'm gonna add dried cherries and spelt. So she really inspired me to do that one. Yeah, and um, it's it is incredible again. When we have this palette of ingredients like plants, and kale is such a sturdy green, mm. one of the reasons, I mean, it's incredibly nutrient dense, which makes it one of my favorites naturally as a dietitian, but I also love the usefulness of it. You can make a salad on a Sunday and it doesn't wilt by Tuesday. That is incredible, but it's also sturdy enough to hold up to the grill. It's just... It, it gets this beautiful caramelization. And if you like a kale chip, intuitively, you already know you're going to love a grilled kale salad. Yeah. So um, tell me, because I haven't read the actual cooking instructions. So do you put it right on the grill for just a short period of time? Yeah, you it put it right on the grill. So you got to stand there. I mean, yeah. it's going to be a sunny day. You're going to have a little bit of kombucha in your glass. And you're just going to stand there and you're going to watch it till it gets to the perfect level the lacy edges are going to go kale chip like, and mm. the rest of it just gets tenderized. Mm. And then you pop it off a little bit of dressing, some spelt again, that nice chew, which feels so satisfying and ch dried cherries. I love dried cherries. Mm. The other night uh, on top of pizza, the very last thing that I did is I took some dinosaur kale. I cut it up pretty finely, threw it on top of the pizza it was probably in there for eight to nine minutes and it came out and it was like little kale chips that were on top of the pizza. So it was perfect. But to your point, I am so impressed with kale and how sturdy it is and what it can withstand. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, before we move on, because you had an Instagram post where you talked about how the Roman empire and your Roman empire is creating salads that people crave. And then you talked about, uh, specifically roasted beet and carrot salad that I couldn't find it in this particular book. I do oh. a totally free recipe every oh. week on my blog. And so that was one of my blog recipes. Wow. Okay. Okay. But that looked really nice. <laughs> it's, you know, 
I, I'm, I'm proud of all of my recipes because, of course, I, I put things out that I, I'm proud of and I've worked hard on. But, you know, sometimes the recipes, instead of being like a 9 or 10 out of 10, you're just like somehow this is like a 14 out of 10, the magic of the ingredients. So, again, with roasting, that application of high heat just caramelizes the sugars and, and beets and carrots. And they're so delicious with a creamy tahini dressing. And then the crunch of panko, just those three, I guess, technically four things all together, just they are the definition of magic. I feel like they could have been in that book. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's move on to nourishing soups and stews. Yeah, I, I think that's pretty obvious what that is there. And again, I had a hard time picking one, but I went with one on page 123, which is our help me out here, Cousole with white beans and Swiss chard, because it just, it looked so hearty, and I just was in the mood for greens and big, white, delicious beans and something that had been kind of marinating for a long while, um, and that's kind of what this photo is for everybody that can't see it. It is a lovely, just like stewy, rich, thick you know, bean stew, essentially cassoulet comes from the south of France. And this one is actually a little bit of a nod to urban vegetarian because in uh, urban vegetarian, I had a cassoulet recipe um, that was not fully plant-based. So I was like, it's time to make a fully plant-based mm. version of this. And cassoulet, if, if people know anything about French food, cassoulet is actually a very meat heavy dish. It's something that is produced over days mm -hmm. and it's very meat heavy. And so I love being able to take plants and give them that richness and that umami that people expect from the more traditional versions of that food and show them that it's completely possible with plants. Yeah. Tell me this, Desiree, because I, I, I know in a lot of your, I shouldn't say a lot because I, I haven't counted them up, but I know that you do avocado oil and different oils in your, in your book. My audience in particular, they, we tend to shy away from, from, from oil. So I'm just wondering your recipes for people that want to get the book. Is it easy to just omit the oil in most of these recipes? I would say in 90% of the recipes, and this is how we make food our own. Like, of course, I've created this recipe, you know, balanced out the flavors in hopes that you're going to get a good result. But oil mm. is very simple to remove <laughs> in almost every, because typically how it's used is just at that beginning to saute. And so when you already have your oil-free techniques, right. sauteing in a little bit of broth, sauteing in a little bit of water, you can use a little bit more acid or a little bit more bullion concentrate to bump up that umami, but it's so, so simple. And I really encourage people to make it their own. Similarly for salt, like I, especially with this book, I'm trying to encourage even the plant curious to say, hey, our food is as delicious or more delicious than your food, so give it a try. So there's a liberal use of salt. But if you have high blood pressure, and you're already used to salt-free cooking, you immediately omit that. Particularly because with my cooking style, I lean very heavily on herbs and spices. So already there's a significant flavor base there. So if you don't need that extra salt for your taste buds, let it go. Well, you even in the, in the opening of your book, you even have a whole section about Spice World and Flavor City and how you know salt isn't the only game in town and you talk about acids and and uh you know onions and garlic and herbs and spices and, and so yeah you do a wonderful job to me setting up all the recipes that that come thank you right? yeah and I, I really want to empower people that the recipe is the guide and you then need to adapt mm. it to whatever your taste bud, like maybe I use too much cumin for you. You can dial that back. Maybe I don't use enough and you need to double it. <laughs> mm. Take out the oil, change the salt, make it your own. Good. Okay. Next Desiree pontification is, and I love this, how to meditate without meditating. Like help us out here. Yeah. You know, I am just like all of you. Maybe I have my nutrition dialed in a little bit more because like I said, this is my job, <laughs> but I am still just a girl, you know, standing in front of her coffee machine, exhausted, trying to figure out how to live her best life. And for me, my 
I wouldn't say my Achilles heel, but like my consistent effort over my gosh, probably two decades has always been meditation. Mm. I'm naturally pretty anxious, you know, add smartphones in there and my brain is, you know, all sorts of scattered all the time. And meditation is such an important part of my wellness. And yet it's the one that I struggle to be consistent with most. And so I think everyone has that story in their life of, you know, this is how I want to act. And it's just, you know, sometimes I get there, it's months of getting there and then months of not getting there and you just keep trying. And so that essay is really about thinking about the tools you want in your life, but also like, how can you make it not so hard? And I read like millions of other people, Atomic Habits, and that book really stuck with me. Mm. The idea that you can sort of stack these habits and maybe the idea of meditating for some feels too, too intimidating or how can I possibly make time for that? But if you can brush your teeth, because we all brush our teeth in the morning, if you could say for the two minutes that I'm brushing my teeth, mm -hmm. I'm going to focus on my inhales and exhales. Or I'm going to focus on how the toothbrush feels in my mouth. That is one act, like just one small aspect of meditation, that mindfulness, that being in the moment. That's a really beautiful way of like cracking the door open to a much larger habit. Mm. Well said. Let me ask you, so you mentioned that you'd, you have suffered or suffer from some anxiety. Um, how does that present itself? with you like what does that look like can you like give me an example of desiree being anxious yeah so you know it comes in so many wonderful it's a baskin robbins of like <laughs> emotional needs <laughs> but you know so sometimes it can look like me uh standing in a corner at a cocktail reception absolutely by myself staring down at my drink because it feels so strange to me to like go up to someone and strike up a conversation. Mm. It can look like me having a very full inbox and knowing that I need to address that inbox and that I have the next 45 minutes to do so and physically not being able to respond to an email. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, or needing to make a, this is the best one, especially in our video, <laughs> in our video world me needing to make a reel for Instagram yeah. and just not being able to show myself on camera. It's very strange. I think being a content creator contributes to this significantly. Um, but also doing content creation work is very strange when like the very nature of this on demand, relentless type of work. Um, yeah. Is at odds with being anxious most of the time. Yeah. Well, every example that you just gave there, I think is something that I know that, uh, that I felt it to, to varying degrees, being at the party and, you know, being by yourself and wondering, okay, what do I want to go, you know, talk to somebody? Do I feel like being an introvert or an extrovert right now? And, uh, obviously, you know, checking emails and you've got 50 that you want to respond to and like, how do I start? And then, of course, as an influencer, you know, you want to get out a certain a certain amount of content on a consistent basis. And all right, what what am I going to do today? And how do I get started? And you know, you kind of got to pick yourself up and dust yourself off, and then <laughs> get in front of that camera and mm -hmm. do your thing. And I'll say, for for me, you know, looking at you, I look at you, and I'm like, God, Desiree is just so like confident, and so has her act together. And so I think for, it's very comforting to hear that to me that, you know, you have some anxiety around these things. I know that I right occasionally do as well. And we're just all trying to figure it out. <laughs> you know, we really are. And I think particularly, particularly around when it's book launch time, and I'm, I'm starting to see the copies of the book going out in the world. It does not matter how much I've tested these recipes. It doesn't matter how many people have told me they who have eaten them throughout all of these stages of development, how delicious they are. I am secretly terrified mm -hmm. that someone will try something and not love it. And it's, you know, 
I was having this conversation with a friend at lunch just yesterday, and she was telling me about a very, very well-respected chef that she was talking to and how anxiety-filled he was yeah. about every time he does a menu change. And I think that's just it, is that we are all here as people trying to put our work out into the world, trying to contribute to the world. And we're also so, so riddled with anxiety and nervousness about it all. Like we, we're all in this together. And I think that's what helps me in these moments, knowing, because you, you start to think that you're the only one who thinks this way or struggles with this. And then you remind yourself, it's not just me. So many of us are feeling exactly the same way and we are showing up anyways. And that's all I can do is I can feel the feelings and show up anyways. Yeah. Well, you have children, right? I do too. Two. How, what are their ages? Uh, my oldest is 13, just yeah. started with high school for us, grade eight, very existential moment. And then my youngest is eight. Okay. So I have a 10, 14 and 16 year old. And so it's amazing to me how your kids just wear their vulnerability and their anxiousness right on their sleeve. And it's, it's, um, Hmm. It, it, it's, it's anyway, I think I find it to be just such a beautiful thing. And, um, yeah. you know, I will say, I know some parents whose children are riddled with anxiety to the point to where it's almost debilitating. And I, and that, that to me is a whole nother thing that I, you know, fortunately I haven't had to address, but just kind of the, uh, the nerves and the vulnerability and the anxiousness that's just involved in, moving through adolescence and those teenage years and everything is, um, as, as a parent, it's, it's very interesting to witness it all. And I think now too, as parents, we have the language and the awareness around these things, because I think when we were growing up, you know, we didn't, you know, my mother and I didn't really, I have a wonderful mom, but we didn't really talk about like our feelings. We didn't talk about these things and, and having these struggles. And it was more just sort of like, you know, like, come on, like, that's ridiculous. Like you're doing great or whatever and like move on. And so I think as a parent, being able to help create this container for our children to recognize that like all of your feelings are deeply valid because you are currently feeling them. And then like, how do we build tools, right? Because we do have to show up in this life. And so how do we build tools that allow us to like, move through these emotions and these states of mind and not act from that place. Cause I think earlier on, I used to act from that place of anxiety or mm. fear. And I think over the years, that's what I've gotten better at is like, no, I can feel this and not act out of this place. Like wait mm. till it's passed or, or to, you know, put on my sort of my, my rational brain and go like, that's not exactly true. So let's do this instead. <laughs> mm. I like it all Desiree. I like it a lot. Let's move on to the noodle parties. <laughs> so noodle party, before we dive into noodle party, you have an Instagram post where you talk about, um, you compare white, I think it's just white pasta with quinoa. And like everybody thinks that, you know, pasta is unhealthy, but let's just actually do a little fact check and compare pasta to quinoa. Can you remember any of those numbers? If not, I can like refresh your memory a little bit. But I think it's oh. really like you, you did protein, you did carbs, you did uh, uh, glucose index, glycogen, and in, uh, yeah, yeah, um, glycemic index. Glycemic yeah. index. Yeah, let's test. Let's test my memory, which I always feel is terrible. But that post in particular, <laughs> I worked really hard on because I knew the response yeah. that it would get, and so. I, I wanted to choose those two things because so many people incorrectly, mind you, think of white pasta as unhealthy, as, you know, without nutrition. Whereas most people think of quinoa as extraordinarily, and it is extraordinarily healthy. But I was like, let's actually like look at the two. So in terms of carbohydrate, I believe that they have both have like about like 43, 45. So I think quinoa is like a half a teaspoon of carbohydrate less than white pasta, which would shock people because I don't think most people think of it as a quote unquote carb, which of course all plants have carbs. Did I get it right? Yeah. yeah. The, the pasta is 45 grams of carbs. And I think it's, is it per cup? I think it's per cup. If oh, yeah, I'm per honest. cooked cup. Per cooked cup. And then the quinoa was 41.5. Yeah. yeah. So like 
Like, so if people are like, oh, see, there is a difference. It's like, no, in nutrition, that is essentially negligible, <laughs> like yeah. no yeah. difference whatsoever. And then even with protein, because we think of quinoa as protein, because it's sort of billed as a quote unquote complete protein, which is a whole other conversation based on amino acids, but it's not exceedingly high in protein. So both have about, it's about eight grams of protein, correct? 8.6, exactly. They're both the same. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, they are the same, which blows people away. They're like, pasta's a carb. It doesn't have, it was like, absolutely it does. Like protein isn't a food. It's a nutrient found in foods. Mm -hmm. And white pasta absolutely contains, yeah, eight grams of protein, which is incredible. It even contains a little bit of fiber and far more minerals than people expect to, mm. in part because here in North America, when we when we create white flour, by law, we add the mm. minerals such as iron that are found in whole wheat because it's such a nutrient-dense food. We add those back to white flour as a public health measure. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the last thing for people that are worried about, like the glycemic index, um, can you remember those numbers at all? Yeah, so quinoa actually just edges beyond the low glycemic cutoff. The low glycemic cutoff is 55, and I'm pretty sure everyone thinks of quinoa as a super low glycemic food, but it edges just into the medium glycemic index where pasta cooked al dente. And now here's the asterisk. You know, if you are one of those people, you cook pasta, so it's like super, super mushy, like baby food consistency. Yes, that is going to have a high glycemic index. But if you cook it as the Italians do, yeah. al dente. So it has like a lovely bite to it. It's cooked, but it's, it's, it's got some, you know, it's got some backbone, you know, as we say, it's tough. So yeah. then it is a low glycemic food, yeah. lower than quinoa, which I know would shock. And that's even before we put stuff on it. Most of us don't eat. I mean, my eight-year-old eats plain pasta, but like most of us put other things on it. Veggies, which contribute even more fiber. You know, you might do like a white bean sauce or a cashew cream sauce, which contributes fats. All of those things further lower the glycemic impact of that meal, which we forget about. So with that backdrop, let's jump into the noodle party section. I'm going to go straight to page 159. You've got a mushroom stroganoff that looks just incredible. Can you explain what we're looking at to those that can't see? So you are looking at all these little bow tie pastas with a very luxurious, like almost sort of like chocolatey colored a uh, mushroom stroganoff sauce with plenty of dill. A, a thread that goes throughout plant magic is also sort of the magic of kitchen herbalism, using lots of herbs, lots of spices, because they are so nutrient dense. Not only do they add flavor, but they add a lot of really valuable phytochemicals that are just so easy to add to your meals. Mm -hmm. And And I think one of the reasons why I gravitated towards this is because in my first book, The Engine 2 Diet, where I had 125 recipes, I had a mushroom stroganoff and it really wasn't great. And you talk about some anxiety, right? I knew that that recipe wasn't spot on, but I just couldn't figure out a way to make it better before I launched the book. And this looks like what I was after. <laughs> So I'm really jealous. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I hope you love it. I I yeah. love mushrooms. Mushrooms offer so much variety and texture and flavor. But yeah. They're really, really satisfying. And they're filled with umami, which oh. I think for the plant curious crowd, so often if you try and make yourself plant-based meals and it just falls flat, what you're missing is that sort of umami moment that animal-based foods will give you without really much effort. You add a little bit of salt and it's there. And that umami comes from amino acids. And so you have to know where to find them. Garlic and onions offer one dimension of umami. Mushrooms mm -hmm. offer another dimension. And then, I mean, our friend Nutritional Yeast, we love her. Yes. If you really want to double down on umami, just pour that on all of your food and you will love it. I didn't know nutritional yeast was a her. I thought it was a him, but you know what? I guess whatever. I think we make her in our own image, right? So to me, instantly, she's a her. <laughs> uh, 
Okay. Um, what did I want to say about? Anyway, okay. So let's let's move on. We're now going to go to stuff on bread, and I love that you have stuff on bread. I am such I'm such a fan of bread, whole grain breads, pita breads, tacos, tortillas, whole grain pizza crusts, um, and I eat eat it a lot. So stuff on bread again. I had to pick just one, and there's a I've been drawn recently to the uh, poblano pepper, mm. right? And I love it roasted and the flavors that it that it brings out. And so I was drawn to your Rojas con crema. Here it is, right? The Oops. beautiful long strips of poblano pepper with corn and plant-based cream, cashew cream, or a cooking cream. I was secretly hoping as I was waiting for you to say that, I was like, oh, I hope it's the Rajas con crema. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So we were on the same page. And that one is really near and dear to me because the photographer of the book, Gabriel yes. Cabrera, uh, he is incredible. I mean, he's obviously he so talented. When you look at those photos, he's so, so he talented. Did a phenomenal job. He did a phenomenal job. And he is located here in Vancouver, but he was actually born in Mexico. And he is dairy free. He's largely plant based, but he's exclusively dairy free. And he's like, I really miss my mom's raja con cremas. So I was like, you know what? I can do this. I can do this. And I had Gab right there beside me to be like, okay, now, now, how'd I do now? <laughs> and when Gabrielle was like, this is it, I was like, it is done. It is in the book. So I was really. So happy to put that recipe in there because I love taco. I love Mexican cuisine. Mm. Mexico City is one of my favorite food cities in the entire world. It's so vegan friendly. If you're listening to this, run, don't walk. It's incredible. <laughs> so I really love tacos. And so I really wanted to have a couple of recipes that paid homage to Mexican cuisine because I'm just such a huge fan. Mm. Nice. All right. More Desiree pontifications on potato chips and liberation. Yeah. <laughs> Set me free. You know, there are so many incredible activists and dietitians who are working to change the conversation about body size and health and also help to repair people's relationship with food. This is not something that I focus on exclusively, but is very deeply in my core beliefs and, and the, the place that I practice from as a dietitian. And so also as a woman, you know, growing up in the 80s, I was shouted at from every women's magazine cover, like all the health and beauty about mm. diets and body size and losing weight at every turn. And so I grew up, you know, early on in my life, I had this incredible upbringing where, you know, food was just food. So my grandmother made these incredible, like the Calde Verde recipe in the book, you know, made these incredible stews and we had this huge garden. And so we ate things like a kale soup, but also chips or some ice cream just sort of with equal footing. It was just all food. It wasn't healthy, unhealthy. It was just all food. And we naturally found a balance because of that. But of course, as soon as I got into my teenage years and in my early 20s, I fell prey to the same kind of body image concerns and confusion around food and dieting that so many of us do. And so, you know, I, I often sort of, you know, make light of the fact that, you know, I found food freedom through potato chips because that was always my favorite. Like a wavy, plain potato chip was always my favorite food. And as my relationship with food changed, I found myself, you know, as many people do, you know, unable to quote unquote control myself around a bag of potato chips. Like mm -hmm. if I had a family sized bag of potato chips, I would just eat them all. You know, because in my head, I had allowed myself to hear that message. This is a bad food and you are doing bad if you eat this food. And as a result, 
I lost that sort of sense of natural balance. And in order to get it back, I really had to go through this sort of unlearning, but also learning to trust myself that I could eat all things, that I would still, you know, wake up another day, <laughs> totally fine. The world had not, you know, spun off its axis if I had eaten pizza the night before, or if I had eaten a big bag of potato chips. And part of how I got to this place of, you know, I said I don't have a restrictive diet and that I eat whatever I want. And that's true. But I eat a ton of healthful food and love it because I got to the other side of unlearning good or bad foods. Mm -hmm. You know, I eat in a way that nourishes my body that naturally allows me to grab a handful of potato chips now. You know, like that is like a huge thing for many of us. It's like sometimes an open bag of potato chips can be in the house. And I'm like, I actually don't want them. Mm -hmm. Before I would be drawn because there was this illicitness, you know, and all of this like guilt and shame wrapped up in eating those foods. And now, no, I eat what I like actually want. And sometimes it's a potato chip. And sometimes I was like, no, that's not actually what I feel like. And I want a big bowl of berries instead. <sighs> I, I find this to be a really fascinating subject because, you know, we, we host these six and seven day um, health retreats. And when I was doing them, when I started doing these in 2010, we were doing them for Whole Food Market's unhealthiest team members. And we'd usually get 90 to 100 that would come and they had to medically qualify because they had a, uh, a BMI over a certain level or a blood pressure or heart disease or uh, prediabetes or type 2 diabetes. And what I discovered in listening to people and, and, and your story, I, I'm, 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 I'm wanting information from you, is that they would say, my problem is like, I can be good for three, four, five months. And then I have that one pepperoni cheese pizza. And the next thing I know, I am 50, I've gained 50 pounds. It's three months later. And now I've allowed myself to just go wild. And so where I'm going is that for some people, they haven't gotten a handle on it and, and slipping up just one little bit then is what has them spiral down that drain. Yeah, you know, and this is a, a, a much larger conversation than, you know, I think we can get to here. And I'll, I'll say a few things. Okay. One, there is a difference between people who have full-blown disordered eating. There are psychological aspects to this, no matter where on the spectrum you land. Um, but disordered eating mindsets require psychological care. You know, we there is often a lot of trauma wrapped up in our food behaviors. And I think this is a really important thing, particularly in wellness too, is the food choices that we make are not always the same as the food choices that others make because we have a lot of other things governing them. So, you know, our our culture around food, our the way that food is wrapped up with our sense of self-worth our psychological relationship and emotional relationship to food and the role that it plays in our life. We also have for people with significant obesity, we know that it's not just psychological. Mm -hmm. And I think this is really important because there is a lot of trauma around the way society says, well, this is just a willpower thing. Like if you just ate in a different way, you wouldn't have this problem. That's not correct because we know that there are metabolical and physiological changes in things like satiety hormones. So the, the hormones that tell our brain that we are full mm. are changed for many people who live in larger bodies. So there's a whole physiological piece there. But just to speak from more the, the everyday, the very common, like what I experienced, this idea of loss of control around food, without a doubt, in my practice, when it's not a defined eating disorder or something more metabolic, like in significant obesity, I see two drivers for this. One, food restriction. 
for the, for the women who come to me saying, I'm just constantly craving sugar, like I always want candy, the first thing I do is I look at how much they are physically eating. When we underfeed ourselves, mm. we are hardwired to drive up our appetite and our cravings for foods because our bodies are trying to ensure that we don't starve. Mm. This is like an, like an embedded part of our physiology. So eating enough food, and particularly when people go plant-based, and this isn't around disordered eating, when people switch to a fully plant-based diet, they often need to eat more mm. because plants are less nutrient dense. So you can't just remove meat or remove dairy from your plate. You need to add extra lentils, extra kale, extra potatoes because it's less calorically dense. And so we need to fill our bodies and our so yeah. that we aren't starving and preoccupied with food. So under eating is a huge driver mm. of sort of out of quote unquote, out of control eating and out of control cravings. Number two is a restrictive food mindset. If we tell us ourselves that foods are bad and therefore we are bad if we indulge in them, that's what turns one pizza into three months. Mm-hmm of out of control eating versus the, if we can be like, oh yeah, I had three pieces of that pizza. Oh, I kind of feel awful. All right, no big deal. I'm just gonna have a green smoothie tomorrow. Like that's where we want to get to, mm -hmm. is that we eat what we want. We assess how we feel. Like sometimes an ice cream just feels great. You're like, that was excellent. That was epic. I loved it. And sometimes we're like, Oof, no, I ate, I made those choices. I didn't feel great. Well, it's no big deal though. It's just one meal. And one of the things that I tell people over and over again is pattern over plate mm -hmm. because no one meal will make or break your health. It's just one meal. It does not matter. Right. What matters is what you tell yourself about that meal and what you do at the next meal. Mm. Mm. Pattern over plate. Pattern over plate. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned that several times throughout the book. That's good. All right. Like, gosh, this is so much fun. So let's, let's go to just one pot or pan meals. I chose page 210, which might be another shroom recipe. Yes, it is. <laughs> so I chose the baked mushroom ferrado um, because I just, well, something about the, fa the farro mm -hmm. and the mushrooms and then you also mentioned in here, you know, you can throw on some uh, arugula. Just you, you captured me with this one. Yeah. So farotto is an Italian dish. It is like a risotto, but made with farro, which is a traditional strain of wheat. It has a gorgeous chew to it. Again, those mm -hmm. chewy, satisfying whole grains and a really rich flavor. And I love a dish like this because you just throw it in the oven and it bakes. It's the perfect thing for like a drizzly Sunday where you just oh. want something to warm up the house. And it has, this one is really for the mushroom lovers. It's a rich, dark, like almost brooding mushroom flavor with like lots of allium veggies. And then, yeah, to freshen it up, like a little bit of like arugula, like dressed arugula with some lemon juice on top to get that bright acidity little extra nutritional yeast to stand in for the you know umami yeah. parmesan it's so incredibly delicious you so you recommend using cremini uh, mushrooms here but would any mushroom work here yeah any mushroom would work you know a uh, cremini or like a brown button just because there's a little bit more flavor there but a mm -hmm. white mushroom would absolutely work and i know that's so so much more available to people okay next section is things for sharing and snacking I actually, I've got two written down here because I just was, I couldn't pick one. It was the, one of the, it was, I think this might be the only section where I was like, oh God, I just, I got to talk about these two. So one of them is your carrot and zaatar pancakes with spicy cilantro garlic sauce. Uh, I think I could eat every one of those. <clears throat> I have eaten every one of those on those plates. <laughs> so I love doing like fritters or veggie pancakes. And so these are, they are so simple because they're a whole bunch of veg, just like quickly done. You can bake them, you can put them on the stovetop. And then 
the really fresh green sauce. So many cuisines around the world, you know, from the like chimichurri of Argentina, you know, to like, everything, to the pesto of Italy, green, really herbaceous sauces, like bursting with acidity. And again, those really healthy green herbs. It's such an awesome, awesome, awesome snack or appetizer. Again, something you can put on the plate and everybody can nibble at. And za'atar is one of my favorite seasoning blends. Za'atar um, refers to like a wild thyme from the Levantine region. So it's very common in Israeli and Palestinian food. Uh, and it's this lovely blend. And I offer that you can make a, a simple sort of dupe at home from very, very basic pantry spices. And it has such an incredible flavor. It's even really delicious on popcorn. Just FYI. <laughs> I can listen to you talk about this all day long. Um, page 240. This is something that my family cannot get enough of. And you, in your, one of the things I, I love too, is that you have a little header for every recipe that just kind of gives it a little um, yeah. color and, and backstory. But you basically say that if there's one recipe in this book that has effortlessly worked its way into our weekly rota rotation, it's these fiery tofu nuggets. So it's spicy tofu nuggets on 240. There she blows. Oh, it was Sorry, there it, it was not hyperbole. These like little fiery orange chunks of goodness they are to me one of the most perfect foods even with my mom so she but she doesn't she makes them every week she does them differently she cuts her block of tofu into four squares and does them so like a sandwich filling mm. or or just putting on the side of her plate so that's how she uses them but i serve those spicy tofu nugs at so many parties and i even though most of my friends are not plant based all of my you know catering is fully vegan and it's the one that people will just go like what what are these? I'm like, that is tofu and you love it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for it's, we all love a Buffalo style. That's really what, Yeah, I didn't call them Buffalo, but it's a ton of Frank's red hot. Um, so it is that sort of Buffalo style flavor, which we all know and love. But mm -hmm. again, to show people tofu, which so many of us think of this, like, you know, sort of like, you know, like either hippie health food or something traditionally that they grew up eating, you know, if they're of, you know, like Japanese or Chinese or Thai descent. So they have like their cultural cuisine. And then here in North America, we think of it as hippie food. And just to be like, look, this is like a cool snack food, protein rich, because we have no problem getting protein on a plant-based diet. Thank you very much. And it's just, if you like it as a snack, uh, it's also a great meal prep because then if you're making bowls, mm -hmm. you have that in the fridge and there's your protein to pop on your bowls. It's just so easy to incorporate into your life and like addictively good. And what I like too is that you mentioned with here, you know, you basically just tear it off so that each piece has its own little personality and different edges that the sauce can kind of cling on to. Yeah, you know, because when you just break the tofu, because there's this natural sort of curd texture, because that's what it's, it is. It's mm -hmm. like a, a cheese made out of soy milk. Um, and just give more nooks and crannies for the sauce to cling to. It's the same with a pasta. Like if you really want your pasta sort of cling to the sauce and you use something textured like a penne regatte that's got all those like little yeah. grooves in it, it just hugs up the sauce and every bite is more flavorful. Yeah. Um. Have you ever frozen your tofu just to, to, for what that does to the texture of it? I love, this is the cool thing about tofu. People are like, oh, well, I don't know how to cook tofu because I didn't grow up with it. It's like, it is, you know, for the, no better way of saying it, but it's so immediately recognizable for the plant curious listening to this. It is the chicken of the plant world mm. because it's just this beautiful blank canvas. And there's so many things you can do with it. Like, you can tear it up and make the nugs. You can freeze it. And then when those cell walls crack in the freezing, you get this incredible spongy texture. And it is almost like a quote unquote meteor mm -hmm. texture for so many recipes. And I know that it wins people over. Um, I will crumble it as well, like bake it and crumble it like a little tofu crumble. I've got a recipe like that on my blog. And then even shaving it, like there's so many different ways to play with the texture of tofu and then infinite ways to flavor it. Yeah. And when you, when you freeze it, I find it, be, it, it almost goes, 
it transforms into like a sponge. And I think it even absorbs anything you put on it, even like threefold. It does. It marinates faster and much deeper. Like you yeah. really get that flavor all the way through when you freeze it. Similarly with brining, and I'm kind of like new into brining too, when you just pop the tofu mm. into like a boiled brine. And so then you just take it out like after five minutes. So you're not leaving it sit in all that salt, but it's just enough to like drive the flavor into the center of the tofu. And similarly, then all you need to do is like bake it with essentially nothing on it. Yeah. And the whole tofu is flavorful. <clears throat> Speaking of flavor, let's move on to really good sweets. 266. Everybody on this podcast, all the listeners know that I'm just a chocolate fiend, right? I am. And so I was immediately drawn to page 266, which Desiree is your Rocky Road blender brownies. Talk to me. <laughs> I love a brownie. Now, I am more of a salt. I will admit I'm more of a salt than a savory girl, uh, than a sweet girl. But I think it's because so often sweets are so sweet. Mm. And now that I'm making my own sweets and making them to my taste, I, I have really, these brownies are exactly <laughs> what I love. They're made with an almond meal base. So again, you've got those healthy fats and protein and fiber so inherently the the brownie base is is nutrient dense not that all of your sweets need to be nutrient dense sometimes they just need to be sweet but i also love making a nutrient dense sweet so that you can incorporate it particularly if you have a sweet tooth more into your like plant-based diet and so this is rocky road which is one of my favorite flavor combinations a little vegan marshmallow and it's just it's well, good i yeah. And you also have some some secret ingredients in here. I mean, you've yeah, got almost not you've the got, only one. You got beets. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, wow. And so yeah, you got beets, you got almonds. I mean, you lay you layer on the um the vegan marshmallows. Do you have a, a preferred vegan marshmallow brand that you use? I am a dandies girl through and through. I I feel like they're the OG vegan marshmallow, and I just think that they do the best job of the texture of the marshmallow. Um, you know, when they bake and you see it, anyone who opens up that picture and sees the picture, the, the marshmallows get all melty. So they they do melt more in baking than like the standard marshmallow because of course there's no gelatin, but they are so delicious. I, I, I agree. That's what we, that's the kind that we buy. And I met the two founders. Oh, no way. At the um, Food Expo West last year in anaheim california they are so much fun and i'm gonna have them on the podcast i can't wait for everybody to meet them <laughs> oh that's so fun. i mean i feel like you'd have to be super fun to to say you know what i'm gonna do i'm gonna start a marshmallow company <laughs> totally i know i know and they're out of chicago <clears throat> um, okay we gotta do another pontification with desiree feeling good is your birthright yeah, you know, and what what a statement that is. Again, I'm I am not the originator of this wisdom, but I just want to be a vessel for whomever I reach. I want to be able to share this kind of messaging. And the reason for this is that we we come into this world with everything that we need to be well. Like babies and and small children have this incredible intuition about feeding themselves. They eat when they're Mm. They're hungry. They stop when they're full. We we think of ourselves as this very worthy, wonderful human before we allow the messaging of the world to start to weigh us down. And so I want people to know that no one can gatekeep your wellness from you. Mm. It's really important to know that you have everything that you need, like every single one of your cells is designed for growth and repair and renewal. You know, we have the tools in our toolkit. They're so basic. It is sleep. Mm. It is, you know, managing your stress, drinking water, eating whole foods. And I know we don't all have equitable access to those things. I'm very aware of that. 
But for those of us who do, you know, instead of spending all of this money on these other things, you know, we could spend a little less and be a little less stressed about money and focus our budget on spinach and apples and bananas and these really, really simple foods that are the juice. Like they are the juice. <laughs> they are the incredible, you know, health promoting things. Uh, you know, it is those basics and that you were designed to feel good and should information or people come into your life that make you feel uncertain about that fact, it's time to let them go. Mm -hmm. You know, it's time to really focus on getting back to our intuition and also our trust of our bodies. And I know that when we receive a diagnosis, something like type 2 diabetes or an autoimmune disease, that it can shake that trust a little bit. Mm. But this is where you focus on your care team, you know, who were designed and they are working for you specifically. Don't open the door to you know, all of this misinformation, focus on people with positive messages, messages of what to do more of, and who are in line with the evidence. Like I said, it is so basic. It is sleep, it is water, it is movement, it is managing your stress mm. and eating whole foods. And anyone who says anything counter to that is probably just to like get more of your eyeballs or even more likely to sell you something. They're like, oh, this doesn't work, but here's what does. Yeah. Yeah, or, or trying to get into your wallet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, good stuff. Let's go. Everyday tonics and potions. The one you got me with the very, very first one, because one of my favorite things in the world, Desiree, is to take two or three grapefruits, cut out all the individual sections perfectly, so there's none of the you know the the rind or anything. And then myself and my two girls, we dive in and we eat the, the different segments. And then we fight over who can actually then drink the juice. And so your first one is salted grapefruit juice with jalapeno. And I've, because I'm now, a, I've been in Austin, Texas for almost 42 years. I've grown to love spice and heat and jalapenos and this spoke to me there it is, there it is. Oh. i'm so glad and i have to say right off the top love is segmenting fruit like preparing fruit for other people my grandmother when i was little uh, used to i used to sit there like she would sit in the chair and i would sit like at her feet yes and she would segment the grapefruit peel away all the skin and pith and just like hand me like that is my definition of so hearing that you do that for your kids is like that well, is love. well the rule the rule is i i really appreciate you mentioning that about your was it your grandmother you said your grandmother. grandmother your grandmother because what i would do with sophie and hope are their names is when they were younger they would both sit on one knee and then the the rule is you have to wait until daddy has done every one and then we say go and then we and then we go. <laughs> oh my god, I love that so much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so but so you obviously you love grapefruit juice? I do love grapefruit juice and you know that I love that you chose that one because I think grapefruit juice feels like a very if if not an everyday thing, not yeah. a completely like extravagant thing or surprising thing. And I think what I wanted to show people with this recipe how just like a moment of intention like you've got a jalapeno in your fridge, like a little bit of jalapeno, a little bit of salt just changes the nature of that grapefruit juice. And you put it in a nice glass like we do in the, yeah. in the book. And that can be a treat. And I think one of the things when we have this hyper fixation with ultra processed foods and like ultra indulgent foods is that we can stop thinking of honestly the incredible flavors and textures and bounty of plants as being indulgent, as being a treat. And so I love, it's just like, let's take this everyday thing like a grapefruit and let's honor it and turn it into something special, something that you could mm -hmm. even like get at a restaurant. And yeah, I hope that it, it gives people a new appreciation for something so simple. And so tell me with the jalapeno, I know you took that one little jalapeno slice and you, you know, you hung it on the rim of the glass, but 
does any of that jalapeno actually go into the grapefruit juice to give it a little spicy kick? Yes. So, you know, we offer that if you're going to make it up in advance, you can just slice some jalapeno in, but you have to be careful because the longer the jalapeno steeps, the spicier that juice. So if you want to make it in the moment, you just muddle a slice or two of jalapeno in the bottom of the glass, Mm. pour in the juice, give it a stir, and then it's just a little bit of a hit. Not too much, I promise. Good, good, good. I'm going to have that uh, this weekend. The last pontification which is this, this rings very true to me. And I want to hear what you have to say about it. You are nature. Yeah. It's this big grandiose statement, isn't it? But it's also so true. And I think, you know, I I say in the book that the world of plants has really given me so much. Like I was a vegetarian since a teenager, but I didn't really enter the world of plants. You know, I was still like, you know, veggie dogs and mac and cheese kind of girl out of a box because I was a kid. Yeah. Um, but the more that I immersed myself in the world of plants, in the the cooking and the preparing and the learning about, but also having the really good fortune 10 years ago, of being able to have my own tiny little home here in East Vancouver and growing a garden. The more that I sort of entered this space, the more that my relationship to food changed, the more that my relationship to nature in and of itself changed. Like when you have that first opportunity to plant a seed in the ground Mm -hmm. and miraculous, sometimes something doesn't come up. (laughs) I've had that happen enough times, but like watch a shoot come up and watch that turn into a fully fledged plant and then harvest that plant and put it on your family's table, Mm -hmm. like a wildly profound experience and something that I don't think we give enough stock to. And, you know, when I talked before about how every cell in your body is designed for growth and renewal and repair. The more that we sort of like let this plant world into our lives, I think the more that it becomes really real. And I think a lot of, you know, when we're, when we're exploring that relationship with food and with our bodies, the more we get back to these basics which are, you know, so every day that, you know, we just take them for granted, right? We go to the grocery store and there's just like this bounty of produce always. And when we really just like take this step back and be like, wow, like this food grew out of the ground from a tiny Mm -hmm. little seed. And how incredible is that? Mm -hmm. I think it then starts to position food in its proper place. And we can have this gratitude for the real miracle of being on this planet with all of these incredible plants that grow alongside us, that nourish our bodies, but they're also like really pretty. Like nothing makes me happier than in the middle of July, just like sitting in my little front garden and like watching everything grow. So I know not everyone has access to green space, but it can be as simple as heading to a favorite park. You know, it's springtime right now, heading to a favorite park and just choosing a bench in front of some gorgeous flowers or some beautiful trees and really just remembering our place in nature. I think most of our society and our messaging is trying to divorce us from some very basic facts that we are humans. We are animals living in this beautiful natural world. And the more we let that in, I think the easier it is to sort of ignore the messaging that confuses us and takes us away from our true nature. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it really roots us. And I love everything you just said. I can tell you that during COVID, we decided, since we were spending so much time at home, let's grow a garden. And we just, we happened to live in a location where the sun just beats down on our backyard and we couldn't get anything to grow. And so just about two years ago, my wife got about seven of these big pots and we kind of have them in in the perfect location where they don't get too much sun, but just enough sun shade and all that easy to easier to water. And so we have, we have rosemary, we have mint, we have broccoli, we have two different types of kale. We've got a lemon tree 
And our children love going every morning and checking it out and, you know, touching it and holding it and smelling it. And all right, let's get some kale for the salad. And so you're right. I mean, you are nature and there's something really powerful about connecting with, with nature that way. So anything that we can do to be in our bodies, be in the moment, recognize our place in nature helps declutter Mm. our mind and help bring us back into our body. And that's a really healthy place for most of us to be. Yeah. Yeah. Desiree, I have so enjoyed this. I want you to know that I want to have you on again sometime in the next six months, because I want to talk about a lot of things that I feel like we didn't have time to talk about. And I want to, I want to really devote this episode to your new book, to plant magic and the magic that you were able to create over the last two years with this book and bravo to you for getting this out into the universe. But when you come back, I want to talk about things like, you know, protein, which we can't ever talk enough about. Unfortunately, I want to talk about three reasons why smoothies, right. Might be hurting your tummy. I want to talk about prebiotics. Yes or no vitamin D supplementation. Um, anyway, just for starters. So you are such a great wealth of information, but everybody grab a copy, plant magic, let it light up your life and your kitchen and your meals. Woohoo! So, um, anything that you'd like to say before we, I uh, let you go. No, just thank you so much to you, Rip, and like creating this incredible community that celebrates the joy of plants and the power that plants have in our lives. It's, you know, the more people that hear this message, the more people are going to feel better and like love what they eat. So I'm so grateful to you and all that you do. Well, right back at you, Desiree, Um, as we are leaving will you hit me with a plant strong virtual fist bump boom all right (laughs) see you next time see you her book plant magic comes out april 23rd and we want to be sure to give this book a big push up the old bestseller list and i'll be sure to link in the show notes how to exactly pre-order all right everybody Thanks so much for listening to this spellbinding episode of Plant Strong. If you like what you hear, please, please share it with your friends and loved ones. I hope you know that word of mouth recommendations and sharing of episodes is the absolute best way to grow this show and grow the Plant Strong message. We so, so appreciate it. Until next week, keep it magical, keep it enchanting. And always, always keep it plant strong. The Plant Strong podcast team includes Carrie Barrett, Lori Kordowich, and Amy Mackey. If you like what you hear, do us a favor and share the show with your friends and loved ones. You can always leave a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And while you're there, make sure to hit that follow button so that you never miss an episode. As always, this and every episode is dedicated to my parents, Dr. Cobble B. Esselstyn Jr. and Anne Cryle Esselstyn. Thanks so much for listening.